Hello, magpies. And are you ready to be aggressively talked at regarding my D&D game? No? Too bad. That was a rhetorical question. You see, I run a fan-made variation on the Forgotten Realms campaign setting set 100 years into the future of the campaign. Organically developed through the events of many games, many stories, and many campaigns. This series I am beginning right now is an exposition of the last century of lore, forming the first step in a larger project of expanding and explaining the campaign world. But first, a brief intro, if you will indulge me. This is a work 25 years in the making, the cumulative result of many campaigns and countless hours of play. I find that many DMs, most DMs in fact, run many different worlds, resetting and rebooting their franchises at will. Me, I have one, this one, and the conclusion of each campaign informs the beginning of the next. This is the aftermath of 100 in-game years of lore. Life imitates art, as art in turn imitates life. Across the scope of these games, I see my adult life unfold, beginning as a generic fantasy and becoming a manifestation of my worldviews and my desire for social justice. From escapism to a symbol for my presence in reality. More than mere stories, fantasy writes analogues to the future and envisions dragging it, kicking and screaming into being. As I completed my degree in medieval history, specialised in popular religious expression, heresy, witchcraft, and classical languages, these themes became more prevalent in the story verse. Thus, the Forgotten Realms became darker, grittier, and the historical analogies written into the world became more pronounced. Therefore, I present Faerun as a world at war. Not just narratively, but epistemologically. At war with colonialism, bigotry, and patriarchs by dragging them into the spotlight vis-a-vis -vis the opportunity for their defeat in the safe spaces of gaming. A world at war with the ignorance of whitewashed medievalism and the misconceptions of new atheist YouTubers retroactively pantomimed villains of faith. A world at war with the stripping away of the mysteries of Tolkien-esque elves, the reduction of immortal alien beings to mere stat blocks, and finally, a world at war with the disempowerment of the ephemeral, the subjective, and the human quality as a thing of value. A war for the heart of the humanities, in a world that seeks only technological exploitation. This is my story told by the path of my life, which I now hand to you to make your own. To draw out what appeals to you and to discard the rest. To find fertile ground to make the allegories of your own wars spring forth and do battle. Such is the nature of this intensely political game we play under the guise of innocent escapism. I have three aims in this larger project of publishing my campaign world, and these aims extend beyond this mere series. First, I wish to extol the story verse. I am so proud of creating part, but side my players. Second, I wish to convert valuable content from former editions of this game for use in the fourth in the fifth edition. Thirdly and finally, I wish to blow my own horn and force upon an unsuspecting reader my bloated overestimation of myself and of my opinions about this hobby. I hope that you will find at least one of these objectives palatable. That out of the way, gather round magpies, because I am going to tell you a story. The parts I have taken from source material I shall display on screen, and the rest developed organically through the cooperative storytelling that makes this game truly special. 
Let us begin. First, with a legend. In the nation of Kalimshan, ruled by genies of power equaling demigods, there is a tale of one of the gods of the jinn known as Brahma the Creator. Brahma was known to be a womanizer, and much of the conflict in Kalashite mythos derives from Brahma's tendency to bestow divine boons and powerful gifts upon mortal women he pursued. In one such legend, Brahma desired a woman who was in love with the sun. In order to please her, he cooled the sun until it could be embraced without danger to her person, and then he enlarged her until she was big enough to embrace her love. But while the sun was cool on the outside, inside a fire still raged, and the pressure of her embrace caused a supernova explosion of unimaginable destructive power as the ring of fire swept outwards from the sun through the solar system, obliterating planets in its path. Vishnu the Preserver, another of the gods of the Jinn, he raised his finger through the middle of the destructive ring and caught it. Thus was created the Sudarshana Chakra chakram of unimaginable destructive power, capable of killing gods themselves. During the great war between two families of jinn, the god Vishnu took mortal form as a charioteer to aid the demigod Arjun whose father was king of the gods. Enraged by the sight of cousin fighting against cousin in this brutal civil war, Vishnu tore the wheel from his chariot and caused it to manifest as the chakra. Seeing the weapon and understanding that the world was mere moments from destruction, Arjun fell to his knees and he pleaded with the avatar of Vishnu to show mercy. Vishnu relented, but now the weapon had entered the world. And what had been done? could not be undone. Our story proper begins in the year 1371 by the calendar of Harptos during the later Goblin Wars, where the forest kingdom of Cormia was nearly overwhelmed by an invading army of orcs and goblins, both of which stirred up by the ancient elf dragon Nalavara. Far from the front lines of this conflict, in the tiny village of Oakhurst, an adventuring party formed that would reshape the history of the world. These stalwart guardians were known as the Shields of Oak and Rain. The roster of these heroes varied at some times, becoming a mighty warband and at others a tiny group of specialists. But there were four among the party who held the greatest sway. Firstly, the three founding members, the elf Linshavari, the wizard Geldarak the Green, and the half-orc Rektig the Mighty. Joining their number later and arguably becoming the most influential among them was the heir Genasi Aaron. To, complete, to provide a uh, complete list of their number would double the size of this history, so I shall mention only these four for now. Our heroes achieved local fame by saving the town of Oakhurst from an evil druid who tended to an undead tree, grown from a living branch and watered in the blood of vampires. Thereafter, the shields attracted the attention of a certain half-elf known as Mendril Bellerod. Bellerod was a rising star of the Royal Heralds, ostensibly a spy organization begun by the Cormirian king Azun Obeskir IV, 
to root out treason among his nobles. After adopting Aeron as his protege, Bellerod hired the shields to set out upon an epic quest to recover the shattered remnants of the ancestral sword of Cormia, so that it might be reforged into a weapon capable of defeating the dragon Nullivara. This quest took many months to accomplish, and it caused the shields to become wealthy and powerful beyond their wildest imaginations. Late in the quest, the shields were witness to the fall of the great city of Arabelle to an orcish horde of unimaginable size. The civilian population would have been slaughtered were it not for a war wizard named Simon the Magnificent, who managed to teleport the entire population, some 20,000 men, women and children, to safety. However, the magic took such a toll on Simon's body that he was aged to the point of death. As Simon lay, breathing his last breaths, the elf Linchavari approached him with a magic ring. The ring was set with three rubies, each containing a wish spell. Linchavari made the first wish, returning Simon to youth and then gifted the Ring of Wishes with its two remaining rubies to the revitalized wizard. Though the ripples of this act would not be felt for some time, this selfless display of kindness would reshape the world. When the Sword of Cormia was finally reassembled, King Azun and his younger daughter Alisair, known as the Steel Princess, set out to defeat the dragon, leaving his older daughter Tanalasta behind, for she carried the future heir to the throne within her pregnant belly. While Alisair's army of noble sons bore the brunt of the dragon's army, Azun himself took the fight to the dragon. Meanwhile, Tanalasta being a powerful wizard herself and unable to tolerate being left out of the fight, she gave her handlers the slip and managed to teleport to the battlefield to help her father. By the end, when the dust cleared, the king and the dragon lay dead side by side, while Tanalasta was mortally wounded. Just like that, the Goblin Wars were ended. Dying, Tanalasta called out to Mandril Bellerod, the loyalist of all her subjects, to save the life of her child. And in doing so, save the Obuskia dynasty of Cormirian kings. Thus, born through a battlefield Caesarian section, the infant Azun Obaskir V became the 72nd King of Cormia, crowned when he was but a day old, with his aunt Alisair the Steel Princess ruling as regent until he came of age. In the aftermath of the Goblin Wars, the shields of Oaken Rain were hired once again to locate the demiplane where the dragon kept their hoard and to secure the dragon's gold to rebuild the country. After some trouble, they succeeded eventually, and they were rewarded with lands and titles. Officially, their company disbanded thereafter, investing heavily in the local economy or just enjoying retirement. All except Richtig the Mighty, who disappeared into the stone lands following the trail of the defeated orcs, never to be seen by humans again. Meanwhile, Alisair encountered a plot by malevolent magic-eating creatures known as Faerim to infiltrate her courts and then to turn them against the infant king. Once the plot 
was revealed and defeated, she learned that it was part of a larger conspiracy and that the last flying city of Netheril, being the empire that predated history, had re-emerged, re-entered the material plane, hovering above the frozen deserts of Anorak. The last Netherese had become creatures known as Shades, twisted by magic, and they sought to destabilize her kingdom, weakened as it was from war. Marching north, Alisair and her noble army attempted to lay siege to the castle, absorbing the brunt of the Netherese counterattack, while the city was infiltrated by stealth by an elite group of war wizards led by the Archmage Vangida Hust himself and including the revitalized Simon the Magnificent. Within they found their chief enemy, the King of Shade, in whose direction Vangida Hust unleashed his most destructive spells. To the Archwizard's dismay, however, the Shade absorbed all of his spells, growing stronger with each one growing larger and growing more powerful until he towered over the city like a dark shadow. The day was nearly lost and many of the realm's greatest wizards, including Vangidast himself, were slain that day. But Simon alone realized that the Shade's power drew from the city himself, city itself, and using the second wish in his ring. He broke the city in two, which fell to the desert below, creating an odd-shaped line of mountains full of wild magic. Thus, the King of Shade was vanquished, and thus, Simon the Magnificent became Simon the Great, Archmage of Cormia. Thank you, magpies. But this, this is not the end. This is just the beginning of the story and an introduction to our cast of characters. We shall continue in the next video and I look forward to you joining me very soon.